A lot to see today, including a look at the history of America's most famous house and a look at the possibilities of life in the universe. First, though, the headlines. An executive salary of $1 a year. That is what the heads of GM, Ford, and Chrysler, the U.S. auto industry's big three, have agreed to. It's part of the plans they're submitting to Congress about how they intend to turn around their struggling businesses. The automakers are hoping this will get them that multi-billion dollar bailout they've been asking for. Some lawmakers have been opposed to the idea, though, saying the auto industry got itself into its current situation. Nearly a month after Election Day, voters in Georgia headed back to the polls to cast their ballots in one of the two undecided U.S. Senate contests. In November, neither incumbent Republican Saxby Chambliss nor Democrat Jim Martin received enough votes to clinch the job. That triggered yesterday's runoff. Late last night, CNN projected that Chambliss would be the winner, retaining his seat in the U.S. Senate. And a pledge from President-elect Barack Obama to work together with U.S. governors on the economy. The incoming president met with National Governors Association yesterday. This group is pushing the federal government for help, confronting financial struggles at the state level. But there are some governors who are against the idea, saying the states should find solutions themselves. Well, when he is sworn in as president, Mr. Obama and his family will make history as the first African-American first family. Of course, they'll be moving into the White House, and that's a building with a strong connection to slaves, one that dates back to its construction. Susan Rosgen looks back to examine how far the country has moved forward. Our national symbol of democracy and freedom. But behind the proud history of the White House are the black hands of hundreds of slaves. It was the slaves that did a lot of the building of the White House. Uh, they also worked there, did the service jobs, where the people that would tend the horses or clean the dishes, prepare the meals. That's the history the future first family inherits. And the Obama's own history is one of slavery, too. Michelle Obama learned just this year that her great-great-grandfather worked on a rice plantation in South Carolina. She says finding that part of her past uncovered both shame and pride, what she calls the tangled history of this country. No, I think Michelle should celebrate the fact that, uh, a, that her, her ancestors had uh, come through the ordeal of slavery. Her children are, are sleeping in the room of presidents, and uh, it's a very great and hopeful sign. It's hard to know what the Obamas were thinking as they toured the White House after the election. Twelve American presidents own slaves, and eight presidents own slaves while they were in office. For instance, Andrew Jackson called slaves unfortunate creatures, but he owned more than 160. And Zachary Taylor said owning slaves was a constitutional right, worth going to war to keep. This year, November 4th, was a new beginning. If there is anyone out there who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible. Tonight is your answer. Susan Rosgen, CNN. Time for the shout out. What planet is named for the Roman god of war? Is it Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, or Neptune? You've got three seconds. Go. All of these planets are named after Roman gods, but Mars was the one associated with war. That's your answer, and that's your shout-out. NASA is considering different landing sites for its next mission to the Red Planet. The Mars Science Laboratory is expected to launch next fall and pick up where the Mars rovers left off, digging up the soil to look for signs of life. But as Miles O'Brien reports, one of those rovers might have already found one. It's about a, a millimeter um, long. Welcome to Steve Gorvan's Wall of Fame. Pictures of the first holes made by humans on Mars. That's a big deal to him because his company designed the drill bits that made them on the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. But there's one picture here that could be a big deal for all of us. I came into the science room and there was only... Uh, one other person from NASA headquarters there. He was at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab a few days after Opportunity landed in 2004. And she comes over and she says, takes a look at this. The next thing we did was 
we both just looked at each other like this. I went, and in our minds, I think we were saying, wow. Wow. Now, I'm not a scientist. I just play one on TV. But that sure looks like a little worm to me. Or is it a rotini? Look, what occurred to me, of course, because I'm an engineer and I can say this, is that we were looking at a fossil. Alas, Opportunity is not equipped to study fossils. Lacking any other options, the science team ordered the rover to move on to the next rock. So it could have, it could have stumbled in... in dumb luck or whatever, could have stumbled on literally the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail on Mars uh, with a key question about life and could do nothing about it. Yes, that's, I think that's a fair statement. We could do nothing about it. Bomber. Pictures by themselves at that sort of scale will never really be convincing evidence of life. We need more direct chemical and biological tests. Astrobiologist Chris McKay would kill for the chance to conduct tests like that on Mars. He spends much of his time in some of the more life-forsaken places on our planet. I found him in Chile's Atacama Desert a few years ago. The idea? Draw the boundaries of life on Earth so we can better understand where to look for it out there. So let's assume for a moment Steve Gorvan's Rotini worm is indeed a fossil and is proof of a unique strain of Martian life. Then what? leads me to the conclusion that life is common in the universe. If right here in our own little solar system, life started twice, well, that means life is a natural phenomenon, it's happening everywhere, that what we see on Earth is not a cosmic fluke. If that's true, where are the aliens hiding in our galaxy? Astronomer Jeff Marcy is hot on the trail. He is the world's leading planet hunter. We're really searching for our own roots out there in the galaxy. He and his team have found about half of the 300-plus planets we know of beyond our solar system. Right now, technology only allows them to locate gas giants like Jupiter. But that will change next spring when NASA launches a space telescope designed to find other Earths. You know, you think about our Milky Way galaxy, you look up into the night sky, our galaxy contains 200 billion, with a B, stars. There are, in fact, hundreds of billions of galaxies within our entire universe. So if each of the stars within our galaxy has, say, one Earth, uh, that means there are hundreds of billions of Earths just within our galaxy alone. But here's the rub. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years from stem to star. Let's say we found another cushy birth for life halfway across. It would take 50,000 years to send the alien civilization a signal. Another 50,000 for a response you wouldn't be able to tell a joke and have the punchline be given on at the right timing. So for now, the scientific hunt for aliens is focused at the pond scum level in our celestial neighborhood. But it's a start. Perhaps we should send another robot to the site of Steve Gorvan's worm and take another look. You've got to have a lot more than just one uh, little image from a hole that we dug a couple of years ago. But having said that, that could be it. Wow. Miles O'Brien, CNN, New York. Kind of blows your mind. Well, we want you to head to our blog to tell us what you think of all this space stuff. And meanwhile, here's what you're saying about the rock band story from Monday's show. The punishment would certainly make me stop playing too loudly, Joyce says. Barney, I can't stand it and I'm in sixth grade. Brady thought the punishment was good, but he felt bad for the adults who had to sit there and listen too. Devin says the band should have been given a warning before it got the full punishment. And Gwen actually likes the songs used in court, saying it hurts that they'd use those songs to punish the band. Well, we want your comment. It's always welcome, but please, please, please give us only your first name so we can publish it. Before we go today, it's kind of like the ultimate story of holiday re-gifting. This Christmas card has logged a lot of miles. You see, when he was a kid, this man named Art gave the card to his friend Bill. Well, the next year, Bill crossed his name off and gave it right back. And the two have kept up the odd exchange for more than 60 years. In fact, Art says it's the only way they stay in touch. When you care enough to send the very best over and over and over and over and over.